Welcome to the Red-Haired Archaeologist podcast. I am your host, author, and sunscreen advocate, Amanda Hope Haley. Thank you for spending some time with me today, studying artifacts our first century Near Eastern ancestors left behind, and considering if those items just might change how we read or read into scripture. This season, I'm shining a light on Egyptian archaeology, which is, of course, called Egyptology. Today, we're going to set the historical framework that I think the rest of the series is going to be built on by just explaining some terms and getting used to the major benchmarks that existed in Egypt's dynastic history. But before we get into that, I want to start with describing some date designations. If you've been listening to me for a while or if you've read any of my books, then you know that I tend to use BCE and CE as opposed to BC and AD most of the time. I want to explain why I do that, why I choose to use CE. For this series, we're talking about Egypt's history. Using a specifically Christian dating system just doesn't make a whole lot of sense for this particular set of material. And then really the bigger reason is that the location on our calendar of year one, which we designate in A.D. in O'Domini as the date of Jesus's birth, that year is incorrect. And that statement is based not just on history, but also on scripture. And so for Jesus to have been born when scripture says that he was, he would have had to have been born at the very latest for B.C., If we're actually using B.C. and A.D. and we talk about when Jesus was born, then we end up with this situation where Jesus was actually born before Christ. And that just opens up all sorts of theological conundrums that really aren't necessary. I also just want to add, though, that choosing B.C.E. and C.E. over B.C.A.D., this is not some sort of a theological statement. And it is not a litmus test that you can use to test a person's faith. I often have been accused, mainly on social media, of having a weak faith or not being a Christian at all because I choose to use the common era designation. I think if you listen to me for a while, you know that I am a Christian. My faith is extremely important to me, and I have a very high view of Scripture as the Word of God. And because I have that high view of Scripture, it's really important to me that we draw lines between what is biblical text and what are traditions. In this case, using BCAD, that is purely tradition, and it's a tradition that actually disagrees with what is written in the biblical text. Those are all my reasons why I tend to use BCE instead of CE. So I just want you to know, in case you're new to this and in case you haven't heard these terms before, BCE means before the common era, CE means common era. That's all that that is. Without further ado, let's talk about Egypt. And um, start with just that word, Egyptology. Basically, Egyptology is the study of Egypt's unique culture from about 5000 BCE to around 400 CE. The first 2000 years of that time period are what anthropologists and archaeologists and people like me call prehistory. And I don't know about you, but when I just hear that word prehistory, I tend to think of dinosaurs of like the land of the lost or the land before time or all those great cartoons that I grew up with. And why is that? It's because prehistory, all that really means is that is a time before writing had been invented or it's a time before archaeologists have discovered writing somewhere. So in Egypt, between like 5,000 and 3,000, the people who were living there were indigenous. They were living on the land in tribes. And so historically and anthropologically speaking, this isn't too different from the tribes that we see in Joshua and in Judges. But Egypt had this sort of social construction of their people about 2,000 years before Israel did. And so in Egypt, and it wasn't called Egypt at this point, but in that land, you have tribes going around. As the tribes start moving and bumping into each other, the tribes grow. Over time, you see with the development of society, people going from just having families, just having tribes to wanting a king. And so about 3400 BC, kings start popping up. 
if you just sort of imagine in your mind what Egypt looks like, and the boundaries would be different than they were today, but sort of picture it, have an idea of what that area of the world looks like. Imagine that the country of Egypt was just invisibly split in half, just right across the middle, so that you have a northern half and a southern half. So around 3400, the north part is called the Red Land. Even though it is in the north, even though it's higher up on a map, that area also becomes known as Lower Egypt. And so then the flip, if you look at the south, the south at the time was called the White Land and Upper Egypt. And this is something that I still have to pause and think about anytime I talk about ancient Egypt, because to me, that's flipped. If something is in the north, then I think of that as up. For instance, most of David's and my family live northeast of us. And so if we're going to go visit them, we talk about, oh, I'm going to go up and see my parents. And likewise, my parents will say they're going to come down and see David and me because we think about up and down based on what a map looks like, based on the cardinal directions. For ancient Egypt, the upper and lower doesn't have anything to do with north and south. The name actually derives from the flow of the Nile River. The Nile River is sort of the opposite of the Mississippi in that it flows north. It has two sources. There's Lake Victoria, and Lake Victoria is in Tanzania and Uganda and Kenya. And then another source is Lake Tana, which is in Ethiopia. There's the Blue Nile and the White Nile. They come together and form the Mighty Nile. And that's what flows north. And so all of that water goes from those two lakes, then gets dumped into the Mediterranean. The Nile from a very early period of time was absolutely essential to the life of the people living there, that that was actually what drove the way they named the regions that were around them. That's why the north is lower and the south is is upper. And even saying this for like the fourth time, I still have to pause and think and make sure that I get that right. Just good stuff to know about the geography of Egypt back then and even now. You'll still sometimes hear those name designations for that region of the world. Well, so you had the Red Land and the White Land. They were groups of tribes that had come together and they've each gotten a king. And in 3100 BCE, the southern king, whose name was Narmer, crossed that imaginary boundary and went north and conquered Lower Egypt. He went ahead and founded his capital at the city of Memphis. Then he left behind what is, for me, one of the great artifacts of the world, and it's called the Narmer Palette. On the front, he's shown very, very large, larger than life. Kings, of course, in ancient Egypt were associated with gods. And so he's almost a godlike proportion compared to other people who are on the pallet. But he is there and you see him smiting one of the people that he conquered. On that front, he's wearing what's called the white crown. In reliefs, obviously, sometimes if it's carved into stone, you don't have the color of white, but you can always recognize it because it basically looks like he stuck a bowling pin on his head. Well, then on the reverse of the Narmer palette, he's shown again, and he's not that larger than life size, but there he is shown wearing the red crown, which is hard to describe. It's, um, it's basically just a column that is empty in the middle and sits on his head. It's pretty tall, and it has this sort of curly hue that comes out of the front of it, and that's called the red crown, which obviously, if it were painted, then it would be the color red. When these two kingdoms came together, they obviously had different ways of dressing. About a hundred years after Narmer came in and put the two parts of Egypt together, you start seeing reliefs where these two crowns are combined into one, and that gets called the double crown. And so you have the red on the outside with the little curly Q, and then sitting inside of it is the white bowling pin. <laughs> To me, this choice, the sort of stylistic choice, it really reminds me of what Henry VII did in England. Prior to him coming in and conquering and really ending the War of the Roses, you had the Lancaster families who their symbol was the red rose and you had the family of York and their symbol was the white rose. Well, so Henry VII comes in, he founds the Tudor dynasty, and he literally takes both of those flowers and smushes them on top of each other, and boom, there's the Tudor rose. And so it's sort of the, it's not sort of, it is the visual of the United Kingdom under this new person who has come in. 
after Narmer, we get to the first real phase of the historical Egyptian timeline. That is traditionally called the Old Kingdom. The Old Kingdom ran from roughly 2686 to 2121 BCE. This is a very important time for the founding of the nation. This is when you get the very first pyramid built. It was built by King Dozier and his architect. You may recognize the name. His name was Imhotep. I feel like in a lot of films, often like the Egyptian bad guys get named Imhotep. Imhotep was an architect and he designed the Step Pyramid. And so if you ever study the pyramids, the Step Pyramid's the one that it looks different. It doesn't look like the Great Pyramids because it doesn't have the smooth sides. It looks like a god could walk up the stairs of it. That was located in a city of Saqqara. Later kings in the Old Kingdom period, they took this idea of building pyramids and they really, really ran with it. And it's still during the Old Kingdom. That's when all of or a lot of the pyramids end up going. That's when you get the Great Pyramid, all the pyramids at Giza. And these structures are important, not not just for their architecture and their uniqueness and all the questions we have about how did they build the pyramids? What they're really important for us as we're learning about Egypt and the Bible together is that it's inside these structures that you start getting the first what's called pyramid texts. That's where you you have the hieroglyphics and you start getting the stories. And that's where the kingdom of Egypt starts recording the history of everything. And so the pyramids are important, not just because they're really cool looking <laughs> and not just because we're curious about the functions that some of them had, but also because of the literal history that they have recorded inside of them. So after the Old Kingdom, you get something called the First Intermediate Period. And then following that is the Middle Kingdom. And the Middle Kingdom ran from 1991 to 1786. The reason the Middle Kingdom is important to us and important for our intersections with the Bible is this is where we get the first records of Egypt interacting with the areas of Syria and Palestine. We'll talk a lot more about this next week. The big question mark here for us is, could this interaction, could this have been Abraham and Isaac? Because the Bible tells us stories about Abraham, who is the head of a family, going and meeting a king, a king of Egypt. Generally speaking, the Middle Kingdom is a time of expansion from Egypt. They obviously go north towards Syria, Palestine, but they also go south into Nubia, which is the region of roughly the area of Sudan today. So that's a period of growth and expansion. Next comes the second intermediate period. There's a first, second and third intermediate period. And they're called that because there's something about them that is different from all the other dynasties of Egypt. For us, the second intermediate period is going to be incredibly important because this time period, it was from 1786 to 1567. This is when Egypt, for the first time, succumbs to foreign invaders. And so Egypt describes this. What they have in their annals is that a group called the Hyksos, they came in, they conquered Egypt, they ruled for about 100 years before they were pushed out. When an Egyptian pharaoh rose again and pushed them out, he pushed them up north toward Palestine. So this is sort of one of the great questions of history. Who were these Hyksos? Is it possible that this is somehow related to Joseph? We don't know. That's something we'll be getting into in later episodes. But the second intermediate period, the Hyksos, very, very important for us. After that is the New Kingdom. If you picture Egypt in a way that it's, say, portrayed in a film or something like that, really it's the New Kingdom that you're probably picturing. This was the golden age of the pharaohs. It ran from 1567 to about 1085. These are the kings and queens who have names that you probably recognize. We're talking about Amenhotep, Tutmosis III, Hatshepsut, my personal favorite, Akhenaten, Tutankhamun, who I think we all know and grew up with. And then Ramses the Great is in there. He is part of the new kingdom. This is, it's a time, once again, of great building, great expansion, great wealth. It's also a time of multiple religious upheavals. So that's going to be really important for us. What was going on in Egypt? What was causing these, these religious upheavals? Why on earth did one pharaoh suddenly decide that he wanted to become a monotheist? These are all fascinating things that are really just tickle me <laughs> and get me excited to talk about. 
So the New Kingdom, it ends in 1085, and it ends actually as a result of these religious tensions. There have been a lot of up and down. And so the last pharaoh of this time period is Ramses XI. He has his political capital up in the north part of the country. But the priests of Amun, they go down into the south and they basically form their own government down there. And so you end up at the end of the New Kingdom having the split between the north and the south the political on the top, the religious in the bottom. That's the new kingdom. That's probably what you imagine is like classic ancient Egypt. So following that is the third intermediate period. Even though you know, for Egyptians, the Egyptian history, intermediate periods obviously aren't considered that important because they're just intermediate. But this is another big one for Bible readers because the intermediate period runs from 1089 to 525. If you think about the Bible, you think about your Bible timelines, this is the period that almost perfectly overlays the entire time that the kingdom of Israel, well, Israel and Judah had kings because David came to power around 1000 and then Jerusalem and Judah were destroyed by Babylonia in 586. And so everything that happens basically during Samuel Kings, it is during this third intermediate period of Egypt. During this time, we see in the Bible, sometimes Egypt is really aggressive toward Israel and Judah, and then sometimes they're allies with them against foreign invaders. In the Bible, you'll hear mention of kings like Shishak and Necho and Hophra. These are all Egyptian kings from this intermediate period. Ultimately, Babylon ends up defeating Egypt in the same way that they do Judah, at least on the battlefield. The difference is Egypt, basically, they just turn around and go back home, where, of course, you know, Judah, Jerusalem is destroyed, flattened. The people are shipped off into other parts of Babylon. That doesn't happen for Egypt at that point. They don't start losing their cultural identity until a little bit later when the Persians come in in 525. Really, 525 is sort of the end of the purely ancient Egyptian culture. Because from then on, Egypt is blending in with her rulers. First, it's the Persians. But then Alexander's going to come and they're going to have heavy Greek influence. And then after that, the Romans are going to take over. And you end up getting Egyptian pharaohs with names like Ptolemy, which are not classic Egyptian names. Those people aren't even of Egyptian origin or of Egyptian blood. They're from the Mediterranean instead. So how do we know everything that I have just told you? <laughs> Please don't take me on faith. No, never, never take anything I say on faith. I hope that I just, with my words, be them spoken or written. I just want to spur you on to be curious and look more for yourself. Aside from me just saying it, how do we know? How do we know this is what Egyptian history looked like? Really, there are three main sources. The first is a guy named Manetho. And then the second are physical artifacts, your inscriptions and your paintings that are on architecture. And then the third are papyri. With all this together, there is no one perfect source. Some of the documents, be they inscribed on walls or written on papyrus, the documents have some differences. Some add names that others leave out. As far as the engravings and stuff go, sometimes pharaohs, when they came to power, they didn't like what the guy did before him. They would go to what the previous ruler had built and literally destroy it. And so we, we lost a lot of history in that way. So when these engravings are destroyed, first off, it tells us what was going on historically, but it also demonstrates that the histories that were written were there to serve political purposes, and they were not necessarily intended to be picture-perfect textbook sources of just raw facts. They were there for a reason. They were written for a reason. You have all of these texts that have differences, but overall, they have more in common than they do different. That, on top of just the sheer volume of writings that we have, all of that works together to give us a pretty good idea of what ancient Egypt looked like, according to the people who lived it and were actually doing the writings at the time. So we have thousands of years of original sources, but they are literally strewn all over the nation. During the Roman occupation of Egypt, there was an Egyptian priest named Manetho. He lived from 305 to 246. 
And he obviously had access to most of the primary sources because he lived there. He was educated. He was a priest. He was able to write in Greek. And he just, he put all the sources together and he came up with one document. Sadly, we don't have any original versions, but what he did was so important that we find him being quoted in antiquity a lot. In spite of this work being out there, In spite of how heavily quoted he was and how important all of his words were, the world lost the ability to understand ancient Egyptian writing around the fourth century CE of the Common Era. So now we're we're into AD after Jesus. The ancient Egyptians, they recorded their language in various ways. Probably the one you're the most familiar with is hieroglyphics. Those are those beautiful drawings, often painted beautiful colors that are all over the inside of all the architecture. Everything we've pretty much been talking about lately really has been hieroglyphics. That was the highest level of the written art form for Egyptians. But there were other forms too. One was called heratic. Heratic was sort of like a shorthand for hieroglyphics. It was used by priests. It's sometimes described as cursive, but it's still very pictographic. It's still images. You can look at it and Horus, the bird, still looks like a bird when it's in heratic. It's just maybe not as detailed. And then after that, we end up with something called demotic, not demonic, but demotic. And that is an even more cursive form, if you will, of the language. And it is starting to approach an alphabet. And so demotic is what would have been used by the common people. Hieroglyphics would have been for royalty, for for some priests. Hieratic was mostly used by priests in religious contexts. And then demotic would have been what everybody else was writing if they could write. Around the fourth century CE, we forgot. We forgot how to read all of this stuff and we needed help. (laughs) Fast forward a long way to 1799. Napoleon Bonaparte is in Egypt trying to conquer it. And he gets some of his men to start trying to dig down so they can build foundations for a fort. And they uncover what we today call the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone is, it's a stone. (laughs) It's a fragment of a much larger inscription. It tells the same story in three languages, in Greek, in Demotic, and in hieroglyphics. Napoleon, of course, ultimately gets defeated. And at that point, the British take the stone and lots of other things that he found in the region. They get the stone, they get it back to London, and they set some great minds at trying to decipher it because these people, they knew Greek. And so these linguists were able to take the Greek, they knew what the story was, and then through their brilliance, through their experience, unlock it. And so through just this one stone, All of a sudden, hieroglyphics were unlocked for the world. In 1822, we finally know how to read all of the original Egyptian sources that are in history. We know that what Manetho put together was pretty good, was pretty correct, because now we don't just have the quotations of him, but we also can go back to his original sources that he was using at the time, and we can read them for ourselves, which is pretty spectacular. If you enjoyed this episode of The Red-Haired Archaeologist, then I hope you'll listen again soon. New episodes are released each Thursday. To interact with me and other listeners, make sure you click the follow button on the Red-Haired Archaeologist pages on Facebook and Instagram. You will notice that Facebook has gotten rid of page likes. So even if you've liked me in the past, you now need to click that follow button just to make sure you're still in the loop on everything. Then please go check out my new redesigned website at redhairedarchaeologist.com. Over there, you can sign up for my monthly newsletter and book me to come speak in your town. 